Welcome to Fall Rise Give, a space where we invite you to dig into the real cause of your suffering. Looking at opportunities for growth with a change in your beliefs, thoughts, and actions so you can be your true self and be inspired. Join us as we explore life's ups and downs and navigate the twists and turns, sharing stories of resilience, hope, and the transformative power of giving back. Whether you're looking for a change, in recovery, or simply seeking inspiration, this podcast is your go-to for candid conversations, raw emotions, and a whole lot of heart. Tune in and discover how to fall, rise, and give back on life's extraordinary journey. Welcome to another edition of Fall, Rise, Give, Turn Struggles into Opportunities by Being Your True Self and Help Others. You know, uh, today, Kumar, I was at uh, I was at Walmart up in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and there I, I was I was in the pain relief aisle because I've got arthritis because I'm old, and falling apart, and I was looking for I was looking for ibuprofen, right? And yeah. as I'm standing there, this uh, this kid that works at Walmart drops a lady off and says, "Well, what you're looking for is right here, ma'am," and just leaves her there, right? So I'm looking for my stuff, and I see this old lady, probably in her 80s having a bottle of pills like right up to her face, looking at it, like her nose was touching the box. That's how close she was touching it. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, ma'am, can I help you? Can I, can I please help you out? And so we, we ended up finding the drugs that she was looking for and I saved her some money because I bought her, the, we got her the generic one. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's kind of weird to, you know, to, to think about things like that. I mean, just helping somebody out as simple as, you know, being at the store, reaching something for somebody that may be too short or, Helping somebody to read a box is kind of, you know, it, it, it's it's helping somebody out, is doing the right thing. Yeah, it's in these small moments that I think life is defined, and I think it makes our day, right? You felt good about it, and it felt so good that you're talking about it today. You know, like one small thing that you did for someone, and it probably for her, right. it's a big deal, right? Yeah, I mean, it took two seconds out of my two two seconds out of my day to help her out, and the kid that worked there just kind of dropped her off, which I thought was kind of, you know. Not rude, but I mean, it was he, he should have tried to help her out, I, I think. Yeah. So what happened with you this week? Anything fun and exciting? Nothing fun and exciting. I think we talked Sunday. We were at the island in a little town called Polsbo. Um, uneventful day, uneventful work. Um, just been um, thinking about life and um, following your passions and running into obstacles and how you overcome those. And then um, being vulnerable, right? And so I was uh, a little vulnerable in my um, situation with someone yesterday. And I'm like, hey, you know, this has been on the back of my mind. Things are not working out the way I want them to. I felt uh, really insecure about what I'm doing in this particular area. And I just shared that with someone. And then um, they basically said, wow, I had no idea. Um, I had no idea that you're going through this particular thing. I had a better connection with that person now that I was able to be vulnerable. Um, they were able to have more empathy with me, but it mm -hmm. took a lot out of me to admit my insecurities with someone else. Um, and in this case, I mean, I can get into it a little bit, but uh, it was uh, it was my wife. And um, even with our close partners, we don't always share our insecurities and it had to do with um, me wanting to protect or not really sharing the details and how it was affecting me. But to even get mm -hmm. there, I had to think about, Hey, this is at the back of my mind. And this thing that I'm working on is not going the way I want it as planned. And so I shared it with her and um, she had more empathy for me. And she was able to understand and feel instead of just coming up with a solution and having empathy. So I think for us, when we have insecurities, they may come out as anger, as fear, as anxiety. Um, they may come out as different emotions that we may have. Um, and I think for me personally, sharing the vulnerabilities with someone was a big deal. And that's one of the biggest things as with this program of attitude adjustment that we call it is people are even vulnerable. People are able to share the deepest scenarios of what's causing them pain. And addiction and recovery requires that you're honest with yourself first 
and then you share with at least one person. And in this particular program, they have a sponsor or people share in the meetings all the time. And so being vulnerable really helps us connect with other people and resonate with the stories of who we are and helps us understand and process that information. So anyway, I wanted to bring that in saying that was kind of a big personal experience this week, um, yesterday. And I know that's the biggest thing out of the attitude adjustment program that I get is other people being vulnerable. I can relate, I can connect with them. I can have empathy. I'm like, Hey, you have that problem. I have a different problem and, or I may have a similar problem, but if we all have one thing in common and that is to try not to drink alcohol as, um, as we're all mostly addicted or recovering from it. That kind of all, what you just said, basically all ties back into the title of our show, you know, the, the turning struggles into opportunities. And then by being your true self, because your insecurity shows your true self and your vulnerabilities show your true self. And, sh- you know, you, t- you take all these things and you, you put them together and that that's what makes you who you are, Kumar. I mean, the, th- the, the, all of all of the bad, excuse my language here, but all the bad shit, you put it all together and you take all the good stuff that you're working on and you take it all and you stir it together and that you, you end up being, you know, the melting pot with who you are. Yeah, yeah. But I think most of us are too insecure to dig into our own issues and to reflect and to think about what's really going on deep inside us. And we tend to just solve our problems at a surface level with the drink of an alcoholic or somebody smokes pot or whatever, or through work or different addictions or whatever it is that they do it with, or through, you know, whatever hobby that's hobbies can be actually positive, but we tend to cover things at a surface level. We don't really dig in deep. It's like, you know, I'm really insecure about my financial situation um what is really going on there we just tend to cover it up we don't look at the bills we don't balance our checkbook we don't look at our budgeting we just go little by little and so what i wanted to talk a little bit about different kinds of insecurities that people have and then how i've been able to see different people um overcome them and then um you know the key to overcoming your struggles is first and foremost to admit that you have a struggle you have an issue Right. And it requires a little bit of self-reflection. It requires insecurity. It's okay to be insecure about something. And then once you start admitting that you're insecure about something, then you start to come up with solutions to start thinking about resolutions and uh, just digging in a little deeper into what's really going on in your thoughts and your mind and your emotions. That helps a lot. And just right. that's why I think the attitude adjustment program is just a great, great place to be um, for sharing about your life, about emotional sobriety, mental sobriety, spiritual sobriety. You really start to surrender. You start to start to let go of the vulnerabilities, realize, hey, you know, we're all human. We don't share our challenges. We all have challenges. I don't know anybody who's got a perfect life. I honestly, don't. No. I know people who are super rich, right. and who are poor, super poor. We all got challenges. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We do. You know, I want to, I want to kind of step back to before you, you know, you joined the attitude adjustment program. Did when you were drinking, were you drinking because you were insecure or did, you know, did the drinking help you to open yourself up and become, you know, the, the Kumar that you thought you wanted to be? So I'm a super social person now. I'm probably more aware and much more skilled and much more fun. I can be more dynamic. I can think about what I'm saying now. When I'm when I'm drunk, I'm just being like everybody else, slurping or whatever. You know what I mean? Just <laughs> right. and I, I'm yep. fun. I think I'm I'm a fun guy regardless. I'm a, I'm an extrovert, right? That's just who I am. I'm type A, firstborn, outgoing guy, into sports, into reading, into personal development, into business, into success. You know, I tend to be up to speed on most of the topics that are out there. Most of the book, the big. Netflix shows or whatever you want to call it. I tend to be in the current events situation, what's going on. So I'm a fun guy. But I think for me, it was really about covering up my insecurities and my pain and my suffering. Maybe things weren't going that well at work. Maybe I wasn't able to correct my behavior by really looking into what is really going on. Where am I failing? Right. And also realizing that, hey, I wasn't living the life of my 
dreams or my choosing. I was just doing a job to pay the bills, to feed the kids. And that's all fine. That's all important. But there's got to be a higher purpose. And I think I wasn't helping anyone. Today, I joined the Attitude Adjustment Program. I share what they call a lead share for 10 minutes about a particular topic. I show up to these meetings and together we make the meeting. We may have one or two new people at a time, but we all help each other grow emotionally, get more empathy through each other, share our stories, get solutions, get ideas for books, get ideas for emotional tools, spiritual tools. Yeah, it's it's a no other place like it. It's like a support group um, all tied into a um, – thing and that theme around spirituality and God. And obviously the key, the key thing is we're all focused on not drinking alcohol. That's kind of what's, what brings us together is our addiction of um, drinking alcohol more than that, more than the way we wanted it to drink. So you may be a hard alcoholic where you're almost dying and drinking too much, or you could be somebody who's just having a glass of wine way more than you should on a weekly basis or on a daily basis. You're not living the way you want to live. That's what determines you're an alcoholic. And that's what this program is all about. Are you a better person now? Definitely. Definitely. Not only a better person, but I, I'm i aware of who I am. I'm aware of what I want. And I'm taking baby steps towards doing what I want. And I tend to pause more often when people or situations that are uncomfortable for me. I tend to not react as much. I tend to connect with others and share with others. Um, I tend to give people more of a chance. I was talking to a guy from Michigan earlier today. He's having a hard time and he's reaching out to me and he had called a couple of times and he's not somebody I would normally associate with, but because of the program, we got connected and um, I lend a year and I called him back and I'm like, Hey man, how's it going? How are you going through your sobriety and all this stuff? And he's had some challenges He's got some other deeper mental health issues and some other things as well, but he's a really great guy and he's trying his best to live the life that he wants to live and the program and the support system that he has through it is really helping him. And so um, definitely a better person, definitely who I want to be. I'm starting to get there. I'm not perfect Mm -hmm. by any means. I still am an ass. I told you biggest, nicest (laughs) asshole people that ever met. I'm still an ass, but less of an (laughs) ass. Less of, less of the time. So you said you're more aware of, of, of you and who you are. So the next question is, Kumar, who are you? I mean, if if you're more aware of the person that you wanted to be, I mean, what has changed between 10 months ago when you were, you know, when you're drinking and today? You know, one of our first shows, we talked about self-worth and we talked about self-love. We talked about acceptance as a key tool. I still am Kumar with my challenges at work, challenges in my personal relationships, challenges in my health. I'm not super fit by any means. Um, Challenges as a father, challenges in my friend relationships with a bunch of friends who still drink a lot. I love them to death, but I don't hang out with them as much as I used to when I was drinking. Um, Right. I still have all those challenges and I think I'm starting to get to that esoteric spiritual level of the universal connection that I have. You know, we're not our names. We're not necessarily our bodies. We're not our jobs. We know that for sure. We're not our hobbies. We are a combination of this consciousness this awareness of us being in this body, having these thoughts and these thoughts are based on our experiences, processing information on a conscious level. I don't want to get too deep here, but we are right. more than our thoughts. We are more than our emotions. We are more than our spirituality in that way. We are this level of awareness, this level of consciousness. There's a story that's being told through our life And to get a little deep, there's this thing where philosophers talk about consciousness and this is all about I am. You are a spiritual being having an in-body experience. 
And as you get aware of your thoughts and concern, associate yourself separately from your thoughts, your actions, and you say, okay, now who is this person inside this? If you want to call your little kid inside of you, who is this being? So I am not sure who this being is, but I, you know what I mean? I'm not a guru by any means or anything like that, but I'm, I'm aware of, I'm not my thoughts. I'm aware that I'm not my actions. I'm a combination of this consciousness that's living and trying to direct my thoughts and my beliefs to get to what I think I want, which is to connect with other people and share love, share positivity, spread joy in the world, give back wherever I can. But I'm just, at the end of the day, I'm just an IT guy <laughs> who grew up in India and Minnesota, lives in Seattle, loves Husky football, college football, and trying to live day by day. You know, I'll go out and have a non-alcoholic beer like I did this afternoon and right. um, at a local pub that I still like seeing my friends in. My dog walk, sat outside, enjoyed the view. I'm just a just a simple IT guy trying to have a little bit of fun in life. Well, let me ask you about that because I know, I know that we've talked in the past that you've got – that, that you like a, a specific non uh, NA beer, which is great. But then you also mentioned earlier that you've got some friends that you know that you don't hang out with as much because they drink more. I think that a lot of people think that once you join the attitude adjustment program that you, you know, you're going to lose all your friends that you're not going to be able to hang out, you know, in the same spots that you were, or, you know, have the, I, I'm, I'm sure that, that a lot of people are insecure about going out and doing something or worrying about not grabbing that alcoholic beverage or not being able to go into a place and, and not have a couple of cocktails, you know? Yeah. So I'll tell you this, and I'll tell you this with 100% confidence. Every single sober person that I know, and I know a bunch of them now, right? I know the tune of 30 or so that I interact with on a regular basis. And a lot of them have been sober for more than six months, years, some of them as much as 40 years. Not one, not a single one would say they don't love it. They love being sober. They thought they made up stories about I can't be social anymore. I can't have fun anymore. All of this stuff because I'm not drinking. It's just a whole different mindset, a whole different hat. You're having more fun. I was telling my friends the other day, I went to a Minnesota Viking and a Seahawk game Monday night, Bob. You're from Minnesota. You probably love the Packers, but... I know you live in Wisconsin, probably love the Packers, but the Vikings were still and always will be my team. And right. Seahawks, and having lived in Seattle for the last 26 years, I've become a Seahawks fan. When they play each other, I try to go to those games. And there's a Monday night game, and a really good friend of mine, my neighbor, um, asked me to go with him. He usually has season tickets, and he, for the Minnesota games, he always tries to get me uh, to go with him. And I went, and by the second or third quarter, I was hammered. We had these really good seats. Randy Moss was down on the field. I saw the first part of the game, first part of this ESPN Monday Night Football deal. And by third quarter, I was hammered. And I guess the game was really close. The Vikings were leading. And at the last minute, the Seahawks came and beat them. I missed the whole damn thing. And you don't remember it? I don't remember it. I don't remember what happened. All I know really? is the Seahawks won. What a lame situation. I was just too hammered and too drunk. Right. And I wasn't like belligerently drunk. I just consciously wasn't there. Fast forward to this year, not just the Seahawks games, but I'm really into college football. Washington Huskies went to the national championships against Michigan this year, lost and kind of got beaten badly in the in the second in the first quarter or the second quarter and a little bit in the third quarter. But anyways, they lost the national championship, but they went undefeated. They were twelve and zero or eleven and zero, whatever that that it was. Almost all the games came down to the last minute field goal or a last minute touchdown that the Huskies won. I got to relish and enjoy every single game. It was right. incredible, incredible feeling. I'll never forget that. And we actually, my wife and I went down to New Orleans for the Sugar Bowl. And we went down and we watched the game and it went down to the last three seconds. And wow. watching it live, watching it sober, man, we had a blast. I went to New Orleans where they have open carry alcohol thing. Everybody's drinking and partying. I wasn't, but I had a blast. I loved being around everything that was – I was – all these things were going on. There were psychics in the middle of Bourbon Street and people were doing this and doing that, getting the beignets the next morning, doing my 
walks early in the morning by the water and the pier. <laughs> I had a blast. Right. And I wasn't drinking at all. Think of the money you saved, really. You mentioned that you're at a football game, NFL games. What's that, 11, 11 to $15 for a beer? And 15 and you don't to 18, drink, depending on where you go. Yeah, yeah, depending on Seattle really? is expensive. Yeah. And if, I mean, if you said you were getting trashed at that, you're, it's going to take you probably eight bucks. or nine beers. So you're a hundred bucks easily yeah. plus tip and everything into that. I mean, holy cow, you're saving tons of cash. I am. I am. I am. Um, we still go out to eat a lot and I still drink non-alcoholic beers. They're not as much as a diet right. coke, but I, we're still saving a lot of money. No doubt about it. But I don't want to ever be in a situation where I feel like I can't go enjoy myself with a bunch of friends that are meeting at a bar. I still go with them. I still go to barbecues. I still go to do the XYZ. I just make sure that I bring a Diet Coke with. I went to a 4th of July party mm-hmm. I was telling you about. 54, I brought some Diet Cokes with me. I bought a 12-pack for everybody else who wanted to have one as well. You know what I mean? So I'm right. like, yep. you kind of give back to anybody else who doesn't want to drink. Um, so were you were you ever a smoker? Um, I did smoke cigarettes. Insecurity-wise, the, my flag just went up. I didn't want to admit it, but yeah. So casual smoker when I drank pretty much through life until 2020 COVID started smoking cigarettes and started smoking instead of one or two a day, about 10 a day. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And became a heavy smoker. And finally in January of 2021, when I said I changed my whole life around and started reading and started learning not to drink, um, I, um, I stopped smoking and I haven't smoked for three and a half years now. Good for you. You know what? I'm proud of you for that. I know that when I uh, I quit smoking on my 30, 38, when I was 38 years old was the last time I smoked a cigarette. Yeah. 38 years old and 340, 30, 354 days because I smoked up until midnight the night of my birthday okay. and I haven't smoked since then. Wow. And, uh, and, that's, and, and that was a totally hard thing to do. But what I did, and I'm going to ask you if you did this with your, with alcohol, is I kept a pack of cigarettes in the freezer. I had one in my car. I actually carried a pack of cigarettes with me for a, a month or maybe two months, just so that way, if I, you know, I, I wanted to give myself an out, yeah. <laughs> which is, which sounds stupid. Now thinking about it now, it sounds stupid. And I had a nut and a bolt in my hand and I always would, you know, run the nut and bolt like this, just so I had something to do with my fingers. And I chewed a lot of gum and I gained some weight, but I mean, I, I haven't smoked in 17 years, you know, or 18 years. Which, That's amazing. Did you do that when you were drinking though? I mean, did you have alcohol at the avail just in case you needed it or wanted to get to get it? No, um, I did order it through Drizzly or one of those delivery home delivery service once or twice. Right. Um, I live in the city, so I'm like, you know, six blocks from a grocery store. And nowadays they sell alcohol in grocery stores. So I literally live... I used to live a block from um, a Trader Joe's. I don't know if you got Trader Joe's where you're at or have heard of a Trader Joe's. Uh, have, yep, I've been to Trader Joe's. They have tons of wine, tons of liquor. And there used to be a Trader Joe's a block from my house, less than a block, two doors oh, down, wow. really. And they moved to a bigger location down the street about 10 blocks away. But regardless, I live in the city and it's, you know, we've got these craftsman homes that are pretty close to each other. I'm... 10 feet away on neighbors on each side. I don't have acreage or anything like that. I've got a, I think I got like a 6,000 square foot lot and a 3,000 square foot house kind of a scenario. So it's just, it's. You said you're three blocks from the grocery store. Yeah. Guess how far it is to the grocery store from my house. Four miles. (laughs) I I wish 25 miles. Oh, wow. 25 miles to the grocery store. And that's if I go to Prairie du Chien. If I go up to La Crosse, it's like 40 miles. So the, the town I live in has three bars and zero churches. That's interesting. 191 people, three bars, zero churches and 25 miles to the grocery store. But the bars all serve food. Uh So, so we've got three restaurants within, within a quarter mile of my house, but (laughs) there's no place to get food other than the restaurants. So, but there's a gas station there. Oh yeah. Yep. There is a gas station. Yeah. So back when I was in college, a professor of mine basically mentioned that he said um, Wisconsin is known for gas, guzzle, and grub, and the three G's. That make that actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so yeah, um, I miss my cheese curds. There's a place down here. Some guys from Wisconsin down the in a little town 
about 20 minutes from here they have they have really good cheese curds but i miss my cheese curds that's my biggest things out of wisconsin that i miss so do you like the fried ones or you like the squeaky ones I like the fried. Do you know what ones. I mean when I, I like the do you fried like, ones. Do you know what I mean when I say squeaky ones though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. fried. So, the, so the people that don't know that the the squeaky ones are cheese curds that come right out from the uh, right out from the the cheese maker from the from the creamery or whatever. And when you bite into them, they squeak because they're so fresh. Yeah, yeah. And I, then they then they ended up, they ended up deep frying them because that's you know the Midwest thing to do. And voila, yeah. that's why we're all heavy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really good. It's really good stuff. So, I mean. There's ways to enjoy life through food and through – I mean, if you're not putting those empty calories in from alcohol, you can certainly enjoy with tons of amazing food like <laughs> cheese curds, right, or French fries or whatever. So, yeah, there's lots of ways to enjoy your life. And, um, yeah, so I, I have a good time. I, I don't miss it at all. And not right. a single person that I know that's been sober for over six months misses it. Right. Not a single person. Well, that's, I mean, you know what? I'm glad, I'm glad to hear the attitude adjustment program works. So if people have problems right now and they're thinking about, you know, Hey, I'm not going to be able to talk to my friends. I'm not going to be able to, you know, be social anymore. That's just not true. I mean, you're social with your group because you guys have meetings. How often do you have, how often do you guys have meetings? So, you know, it depends. There's 2 million people in the U S that are part of the attitude adjustment program. So there's meetings everywhere. Every town has one. Uh, small towns may not have as many as often. Um, I go down to see some friends in Oregon, on the Oregon coast. There's one town that maybe has like 6,000 people or less than that even. Uh, I think like 2,000 people. They have a meeting once a week. And okay. so um, there's meetings in towns once a week. But, you know, in this modern world of Zoom, there's meetings all over the world, 24-7, going on all the time, especially English-speaking ones. So there's, if it's night, I have a friend who, who attends Australian meetings all the time. I've got a friend from New Zealand who attends our meetings from Zoom. Um, there's a meeting every morning and every night that I'm a part of through Zoom. I don't really go to in-person meetings, but I go to meetings in the morning, sometimes on the weekends. I used to go with them a lot, but I have to work nine to five kind of a thing. So I can't really do a morning meeting. Um, the one that I like, it is at 8.30 Pacific time. And then the one at night is at 7 p.m. I'm actually going to be talking in that one today. And I'm going to be talking about a similar topic. How our insecurities define us. Our insecurities, once we are able to get comfortable with them, the only way to get comfortable with your insecurities, my friend, is to talk to another person about, hey, this is this thing that's bothering me or that I don't think I'm good enough in this scenario or something is wrong with me in this piece of my relationship's not working. Find a friend, find an attitude adjustment program if you have a recovery issue, find somebody to share, even if it's a therapist, but most of us have friends who we can share stuff with. It's just a matter of reaching out, saying, hey, I've got a question. Maybe you can help me out with something. I'm going through this particular situation. I just need somebody to hear me out. Um, there's a woman that I'm trying to think of. She's the queen of vulnerability, uh, Brené Brown. And um, so Google Brené Brown, folks. She is the queen, and she talks about happiness and joy and all this stuff. And she really talks about how through our vulnerabilities, we're able to um, get into a place of self-love, self-worth, and really start to get down this path of happiness and enjoyment that we want to have. But connecting with others is a huge part of that. And the best thing you can do with connect with somebody else is to say, have, hey, can I just tell you something? Is it okay? You, we all have somebody we can go to. And if you're able to say, hey, can I just tell you something that's bothering me or top of my mind without unloading on them, be conscious of that, right? Saying, you know, I'd love to be there for you as well, or we're already friends, but I want to share this thing that's in the back, back of my head that's bothering me or it's really something that I'm struggling with. And people will lend a hand. So it seems like a, a, the way out of your insecurities is kind of what we talked about last week with the, uh, the being humble. You know, I need some help. I want, can you help me out? Basically, just ask somebody and 
so it all ties in together. It does. It's humble. You know, people who are humble are super confident. How to get to super confidence is through thinking less of yourself, thinking also people who are insecure. I mean, you know this. They're the ones who are arrogant. They're the ones who think they're better than others. Why are they driving that fancy car? What are you trying to compensate for? Uh, as we're um, talking about this, about an hour ago, and I was walking my dog back to the house uh, from the local place, and uh, I saw this Lamborghini in the neighborhood. And I was thinking to myself, and it's not that I don't have a fancy car. I have a pretty good sports car SUV myself. But I was thinking a Lamborghini sitting so low, it's a three to $400,000 car sitting so low and I'm sitting there going, that's a real sports car. It's not an SUV. An SUV, you can go up and, you know, take your stuff, hiking, biking, whatever, take your stuff, lug right. with you everywhere. It's a sports car made to be on a track. What are you doing with that thing? Are you just driving around the neighborhood in a car that's super low to the ground? And I was just like, what? Showing what's, off what, is what it is. Showing off. And why are you showing off? Let's think about that for a moment. You don't feel good enough about yourself? I want you to think about this. Think if you had that in the Midwest, potholes, it'd probably eat that thing alive. <laughs> yeah. We got potholes here, by the way, as well, but I hear you. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And I don't live in the neighborhood. There's a tons of Ferraris and Lamborghini, just so you know. I just happened to see one. Right. I've seen them, I've seen them once in a while in the neighborhood. They're, we have a pretty popular neighborhood from a standpoint of a lot of tourists come in and out and got some great shops and um, great views. So it's a very popular neighborhood. You got any last thoughts? Any final thoughts on insecurities? Yeah. I mean, as soon as you feel insecure about something, share it with someone. Find somebody to share it with. Hey, I'm insecure about X, Y, Z. You know, I was uh, presenting to my executives at work about a month ago, a month, a month and a half. I was just getting hammered every week and presenting Project Going South. And I told my boss, I said, I'm insecure about this X part of this problem. I don't know how to tell that story. Can you help me out? And he walked me through a couple of points that I had to make. And they really mm -hmm. helped me to make sure that I had those right points. Make sure my story had the right level of data, right level of pieces for the work that I was trying to accomplish. And so asking him for help was really important. I actually used the word, I'm insecure about this. I'm insecure about this presentation. I'm insecure about X, Y, Z. And that really helps. Even in a professional environment, I think. Being vulnerable is one of the most powerful things you can do. And Brene Brown, my God, Google her. She's got TED Talks. She'll have you crying, laughing, having a good old time on your, um, on your journey to happiness. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Fall Rise Give, where we explore stories of resilience, growth, and giving back. If you enjoyed today's episode, please visit our website at www.fallrisegive.com. Also consider subscribing to our podcast on your favorite platform and leaving us a review. Your feedback helps us to continue to bring you inspiring stories. Stay tuned for our next episode. And remember, every fall is a chance to rise and every rise is an opportunity to give. Until next time, keep falling, rising, and giving. This is Fall Rise Give, produced by podcastforhire.com. Thank you for listening.